This ain't your home anymore, John. You gave that up some years ago. Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. Scholars, welcome back to Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger. I'm a professional artist and master educator attempting to provide you with the best in art historical content. So uh, if you like the content, follow along. All right, Professor Dickweed. Today we're back at the Des Moines Art Center. We're going to look at their uh, permanent collection. So we'll go inside and take a look again. Part two of two. Here we go. Again, we're going to be exploring the permanent collection at the Des Moines Art Center. Really a great little art collection in the heart of Des Moines, Iowa. If you're going through there, I highly recommend a stop and checking out all of the things. As most of us are aware, there are constantly things being pulled in and taken out, and there's always something new to see when you visit a place like this. So, without any further ado, let's start looking at 11 pieces in their collection that I've selected out for this one. And we're going to start with a master, Auguste Rodin. Nude study for Burgers of Calais, created in 1885-1886. Now I've done another video specifically on the Burgers of Calais so you can get the information on that but this is a study. He did multiple studies and multiple works big and small for this very elaborate monument piece that he would create. This is one of those burgers that he had done as a nude study and it is said what he did was he created this casting then placed the robes and drapery on top of this to see how it would fall before casting it with robes and other adornments my brothers and sisters the real mighty ones now it's just not a visit to the des moines art center unless you stop by and say hello to aunt fanny aunt fanny or old lady in black was created by george bellows back in 1920 Bellows was a American realist who's most known for his work in New York and learned from one of the masters of the Ashcan School in New York. And a lot of those techniques and sentiments are very much embedded into Aunt Fanny. But for now, we're going to bring it back to an Iowa native and Iowa icon, Grant Wood. Arguably the greatest artist from Iowa and certainly the most iconic with this painting, the birthplace of Herbert Hoover that he created back in 1931. This work has so many classic elements of classic Grant Wood. You know, you look at the trees and those sorts of elements and it just screams, this is Grant Wood. Now, Herbert Hoover's actual birthplace is in West Branch, Iowa, not too far from the old stopping grounds of Grant Wood, and it's also the only Iowa native to become President of the United States. Side note, half of the time this painting is not at the Des Moines Art Center because it is co-owned by the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, so if it's not in Des Moines, it's in Minneapolis. So always be aware that sometimes your favorite works might be somewhere else. He's got to have overalls. You okay, know? all right, I'll back off. Francis Bacon, a prominent surrealist who created some of the most interesting and unique pieces of the 20th century, also is known for creating study after Velazquez's portrait of Pope Innocent X. Like so many artists across time, Bacon was very much influenced by Diego Velazquez's 17th century artworks, including this portrait from 1650 of Pope Innocent X. But there are subtle little things that are very unique and very different. You know, you look at the mouth and the glasses or the monocle that's on the face of Pope Innocent, which clearly wasn't there. So why was that added? Well, Francis Bacon was also very much influenced by film and movies, and there was a film that came out in 1925 called The Battleship Potemkin in a scene where a lady was shot in the eye, and he was so moved by her mouth and the glasses and the whole thing that he ended up incorporating that into this particular painting, so that's where it comes from. One trick is to tell them stories that don't go anywhere. Lately, my work has been influenced by a couple of unique sources, and one of those sources is this particular work called Woman Walking Number 1 from 1963 by an artist by the name of Isabel Bishop. 
Now she was an artist and an art instructor who worked primarily in New York and this is also where she had her own studio. During lunch and things like that, she would observe the women walking back and forth, going to their normal day-type jobs and whatnot. And she was very much influenced by these observations and created several works like this that really focused on women and them going to work and things like that, but from a female perspective as opposed to a male perspective. And this is a really great example of her work. Now, Joseph Beuys was a German artist, theorist, educator, and so on. And he would create this particular work in 1974 called Energy Plan for Westman. And it's a big piece of slate with chalk on it. And during this particular time period, his work, his art, his teachings, his political beliefs, and so forth were all kind of fused together. And at this time, he was doing a lot of performance art pieces. And one of the performances that he would often do was in a lecture sort of format. And he began to save the chalkboards that he would use during the lectures and then preserve those and essentially use those as a piece of physical artwork. This particular lecture was from the Minneapolis College of Art and Design during his first trip to the Americas, and we can kind of see his thought process and how he would fuse different ideas and things like that together in this very unique piece of artwork. Now we're on to Jean-Michel Basquiat and this untitled work from 1984 which really focuses on this pop art type theme that is a commentary on American consumerism and it's got this undertone of slavery to it. We see the words sugar and tobacco placed on there with this very iconic figure, this skeletal type figure. And what Basquiat is saying is really about the advancement of these cash crops, which really boomed during the transatlantic slave trade and the enslavement of 20 million plus people and all of their descendants. He's trying to get us to think, not just observe something pretty. I show people that it's not all fun and games. As we've explored several museums all around the country, one of the names that has been very consistent is Deborah Butterfield. Deborah Butterfield has worked with horses and she's lived in Montana working with horses and is very well known for her sculptural pieces, again, focusing on horses. And this particular work that's untitled, or Hoover, from 1986 is another example of that exact type of work that we've seen before if you've been watching Art 101 with Mr. Berger as I've gone to various museums all around the country. This particular work is made out of tin and it's got a metal armature and the likeness to a horse is just phenomenal. I love her pieces. And so I would be absolutely crazy not to include it in this walk through the Des Moines Art Center as well. I think this might be the third untitled piece that we've come across in this little tour. And this is from Anselm Kiefer, untitled from 1987-1988. Kiefer is a who focuses on themes of German history and the Holocaust and things like that. And with his being a German, the ideas that he's presenting hit very close to his home. He was the son of a German art teacher and he uses the themes to create very powerful works like this one, this very large two-panel painting that illustrates the train tracks. And when I see the train tracks, I think of the words by Elie Wiesel of the descriptions in his book, Night, where he's traveling by the train, traveling into the work camp. And just the horror that was going on during the Holocaust. And we see the latter, a method of escape from this horrible situation. The ballerina shoes, a dream that's been shattered and lost. All along the decomposition, the rot and the material on lead that is literally falling off of the surface onto the floor. Andy Goldsworthy is an English sculptor, photographer, and environmentalist who does some really, really unique site-specific works, and one of the works that he is responsible for having created is a series called Three Karens from 2002, and I gotta think that this work has been here longer than 2002. It boggles my mind to think that this work has been here only since 2002, because in my mind, this work has been here forever, but clearly not. And 
Anyway, in this workout in the garden, we see this large egg-looking figure and the three Karens, or the three little homes that it can go into or slide into. It's such an interesting piece. If you walk out back behind to the Rose Garden, you'll see the three Karens, and it's such a great piece. It really fits perfectly in this spot, and the Des Moines Art Center is very lucky to have that in their permanent collection. Kiki Smith is a contemporary artist that works with a lot of different themes from sex, birth, and regeneration, and this is kind of one of those, Bandage Girl from 2002. In this particular work, as she does with several other of her works, she creates these presentations of humans where their form and the elements and the power of the messaging is really in your face. She works a lot with the female form, and this is no exception. We can see the bandages around her. We think about what these bandages mean, what is the story, and the power of these works, the power of her work in general, is so in your face. You just have to pay attention and look and observe, and you want to see the front, the back, the sides. You want to see the whole thing to really get a clear idea of what's going on, and this is one of the more powerful pieces. Now, before we get out of here, I want to give you one last piece of information on the building itself. Over the years, the Des Moines Art Center has been added to three times, three different architects, three different ideas, three different spaces, all trying to house one collection. Back in 1966, the Des Moines Art Center was getting ready to expand once again, and they went to one of the most prominent architects of the time, I. M. Pei, the Chinese-American artist, who is probably best known for his work at the Louvre, and they would commission him to do this edition, completed in 1968. Now, one of the most interesting things in my mind is when you go to the back and you're standing in the Rose Garden and you look back at the building, you can see his signature, Pei, right across the windows of the Des Moines Art Center itself. The artist truly has signed his work in this situation. I appreciate you following along and uh, taking a look at this uh, private collection again at uh, the part two of two here. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. You have a good day. <laughs> Classic.